Hello and welcome to the Brainstorm Podcast. And now, your host, Sonny Perlman. Hey, today we had a podcast with a guy who works for me, Shalom Gutlaser, who uh, just finished social work school, but is quite talented and incredible at what he does and really, really intelligent and love working with him. And I got to, I know it's been a while since I did a podcast, but I got to do my first podcast since the holidays and we had a blast. We talked about a ton of topics. Um, just, it felt great. We actually, I think this was the longest podcast that I ever had. So I hope you enjoy. I sure did. All right. We are on. Shalom. Hey, Sonny. It's really awesome to have you here. This is great. Uh, we'll try to get the mics right. Okay. Let's get them in. I just want to say one thing very important. We took a big break from the podcast for the last month because of holidays. And it is very important to start again. So mm. you are officially starting me off again. There we go. So we are we're rusty. We're getting back into it. And I am very excited. Um, for the people out there, Shalom works with me. So I get to see him a lot. We have a lot of cool conversations. So you get to be just part of this really exciting thing. So Shalom, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. It's an honor. Okay, so we're going to talk, I think we're going to start talking about a little bit, you are, even though you're new as a new social worker, mm. you just graduated, Yeah, and I hired you as the uh, clinical director directly out of school, because I know you for a long time, and I know how awesome you are, um, but you have just left school, and you are seeing this field from eyes that I haven't seen it for many, many, many years. Yes, this is true. And so I'm really excited to kind of get into where that is, especially a lot of people that listen to this are interested in going into the field or are in the field or going to therapy and they just kind of want to get that idea of what's happening. Yeah. So I do want to kind of pick your brain about that. I also want to know a little bit about um, what your experience has been working here for me. I'm always curious how what people think about working for me. You want my thoughts on the record? Thoughts on the record. <laughs> on the record. I am very, very curious because um, this is uh, obviously we do things a little bit differently than. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like oh, it. yeah. You say, oh, yeah. All right, oh, let's yeah. start there. We'll go back to school in a second. Okay. What do you mean, oh, yeah? Let's hear what the oh, yeah means. No, it's uh, I've been having this conversation with quite a few people, actually, because, I mean, you know, sometimes the residents don't realize why we do what we do um, or how we do what we do, and the parents don't really realize it or know. So I really have to explain this quite often. And it's the way we're set up is that we're optimizing everything we can for the benefit of our clients. And in, in ways that can't happen in a normal clinical setting, and it doesn't happen in a normal clinical setting, like, right. we get to easily give our residents a hug, right? And say, I love you, right? And show them the love. And, you know, in, in, in a regular clinical setting, there's a desk in between you, right? Or right. there's handshakes can be weird, right? Or should you be giving a handshake? Should you not? How is this for the client, right? And right. it's, I mean, over here, it's just this, this energy of love and, and support. That's, that's all it is there. And that's all that we, that's all, and that's all they really need. Well, I mean, some people say they need a lot, a lot more. Even I agree that they need a lot, a lot more. But it seems that, well, in my experience, I'll throw it in there. I get to say my experience. Nothing really works till you feel safe. Right. And and that's what I mean. And that's that's really the, like everything is good. Like, and it's interesting because you, uh, I'll say a little bit about you, is that you're a like super clinical dude. Like you actually like reading those books on different theories of clinical he's laughing this is why we need video <laughs> um like you I, you know i i think 
after I left school, I didn't read another like textbook or clinical <laughs> book for like ten years. Like I, I'm, I'm still like, growing through my textbooks. Right, I love this you stuff. are like a geek about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, completely. I love so, this field. A lot of stuff you've been learning is not what we do here, in a weird sense. Like you could integrate right. it all. Yes, yes. That's but, we're not we're not doing any of that directly, but there's space for everything here. Right. Which is which is crazy. It's just it's also getting creative in how to do it, right? right? Like just doing a quick uh, like this week, I got to do a little bit of IFS uh, with with one of our clients. Right, it's a lot of fun. I mean, he has experience with it. I have a little bit of experience with it. My supervisor is an IFS supervisor, right. so you know we have the reasons to do it, and it was really cool way to experience that connection. Right. So you have guys coming in, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna interview you as if I don't work here for a second. Yeah. If guys coming in. And you, you have to figure out how to get them to a place of safety and feeling safe and, and loved, right? I mean, we've talked, I've talked about this on the podcast tons of times. And in, in social work, we call that, you know, being where the client's at is part yeah. of this experience. Um, so one of the things that I know we've talked about, and I'm curious if you have like a, like a perspective on this, but like, what are those things that we could do that we could do here? And you mentioned hugging, but like we, we do here um, examples of things that would that would be so different than you would see in another clinical setting. Yeah. So firstly, you want to know my um, what I thought. I would just wondered what would it be what would happen if I said the I, I, I don't have any thoughts. <laughs> I just want to know what you would do. I'd go to another question. <laughs> go to the next question. Oh um, no. So okay, that's a very stoic thing, by the way. You study the Stoics? You have a, a little bit, of okay. course I did. So the Stoics have this idea. Um, I know you had philosophy, so we're going to get into philosophy a little bit. But the Stoics have this idea that you do not have to have an opinion on everything. Right. It's a, It's such, it sounds like a simple idea. It's so difficult. But it's, imagine someone says something, and I'm like, the truth is my wife has a wig business, right? Mm -hmm. It's awesome. But, after like every once in a while, like she always asks me, like, "What do you think about this and this?" And I and I realize I, I just don't have an opinion on any of it. <laughs> I I found out a new word, weft, a weft of hair. Like oh. this is a brand new word for me. What does that mean? I don't know because I I have no opinion. <laughs> it's just the word. <laughs> it's a new word. <laughs> what yeah. I'm saying is she asked me about it, and I'm like, I have to come up with an opinion because she wants me to come up with an opinion. But so it's fine to have no opinion on it. Yeah, I mean that happens with my wife also. Well, she'll ask me, "Oh, what do you think of this?" And I say, I have no idea. I have no idea. No idea. Wait, what do the reviews say? And we'll go with that. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> so you you want to answer the question? or You have no idea. Yeah, no. I mean, I do have an, an idea over there. Um, I'll give an example. This has been it's been interesting trying to figure out um, how to show up because there's um, I juggle a lot of things. Thank God, I do a lot, and um, I can be busy. I'm not always busy, but I can be very busy. And to know when it's when it's right for me and for the residents and clients here, you know how to show to show up in different ways. So, for example. Um, somebody texted me, um, expel me from the house this week. Right. Um, and it's at like, this is like 9 30 PM. Um, we just finished doing laundry with my wife. We were folding some laundry, watching a TV show. The text show. just said, expel and me from the house. Yeah. I think there's a little bit more to it. I don't have my phone on me right now, but right. It's something a little bit more. And I was like, what's going on? And he's like, I'm done. So I asked him where he was and he was in his, he was in his room. So I got in my car came here. I was thinking about it. I was like, should I, should I not? I said, you know what? Um, I love this guy and he really needs some support right now. Right. So I drove over here and you could not do that in a regular clinical setting. I'd show up to your, I mean, some clinical settings allow you to show up to the client's house, but there's so many things going on there. Right. Right. With this, I was able to go in. Um, I just want to also mention that you could have easily just said to one of the counselors, Hey, go give him a little more attention. Oh, I, and you did do that afterwards. Yeah. And, and, I but thought about that also. You got up and went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, and the question really is, what's best for um, the client? What do they need? What What would show them the love and care that we really have for them? Right? What, how can I best show them that? Because right. I think a, a big thing that we do is also convincing these guys that they're loved. Because they just don't want to believe it. They want to feel. They want us to believe that they're as bad as they've been told 
and that therefore they think they are. Yeah, but even listen to that statement that he said, expel me. Yeah. He doesn't want to leave. Oh, oh, oh. He I wants t- you to reject him. <laughs> yeah, when I went I went when I went to go sit with him, I said, I I, I can I, if you I will not expel you. If you want to leave, you can leave. It's okay. And I'll still love you, but and you can leave. Uh, and he said, No, I want you to expel me. I s- I said, I, I won't do that. I'm sorry. We don't do that here. I love you and you're here. He wants confirmation that he is a terrible person at that time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, our our way of responding is, Shut we're here up. for you. We're here. And then eventually you change that idea. It takes some time. It takes some time. But you start seeing, which is one of the most beautiful parts of this, is starting to see these guys, um, you know, expressing how they're doing better and they are better. You know, and you kind of, it's a subtle change in the language. Right. But you'll hear them in the beginning say, oh, I'm doing more, so I'm, I'm feeling better. Then you'll ju- you'll hear them being like, no, I'm good. You know, we have some guys here who are just like, oh, I'm doing great. Everything's great and things are great, even when things aren't so great. Right. Because they could feel that they're okay, even though things aren't going so well. And that's, and I think that's a testament to how well this thing, this works. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, we were talking before, because I know you had gone through a little me offering this job, and I think it's an awesome job. Um, but, there was some challenges because this is not a typical clinical position and you are super yeah. stoked about the oh, clinical stuff. Oh, I love sitting. I, I love my one-on-one clients. Right. I love sitting down. I love the therapeutic process. I love getting in the weeds. I mean, also d- d- discussing social work for a moment that, uh, that micro meso and, and my, and, and macro work right from all levels with even one client noticing what's going on outside them. That's affecting them. What's going on in the community? What's going on within them? All those things together so as an approach I like to take. And I try to see. So you kind of go in, the, in a session um, from like everything that's going on um, in the world that's affecting them and everything that's, you know, these, 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 these biases that they get just from being in 21st century in America right. that they feel about themselves and, and whatnot. And then going to like what the community, the, the response that the, of their community to them. And their response to the community, and as well as their families, and then to them themselves, and as well as tools and, and all these things. I mean, just from every level, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. So you're saying business. when you're here, it's you're able to touch on all that, oh, and with not only that. That I was, I was actually just talking about the clinical, the clinical. work one on one. When you do one on one, how do you how do you get into all that? It's 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 sometimes difficult because we only have you only get in uh, the perspective of him. We are getting his perspective, but we get, uh, yeah, we get the the client's perspective of what they're going through. Um, But also we get to discuss um, how they're being affected by it. So it's all through their lens, obviously. So we're not controlling their community, but I am discussing with them how to get more involved in community. Right. What's going on with the community that they're in. Right. right? How are their, how are their friendships? Right. There's a really cool uh, talking about clinical stuff. There's a really cool therapy. It's not. It's not so famous. I actually only heard about it in school, um, which is interesting because I hear about most things out of school. Right. Um, is IPT interpersonal psychotherapy, mm-hmm. and um, it's very manualized. And I, I don't really love all the manualized stuff about therapy, but um, what do you mean manualized? Like, like kind of see. So CBT is kind of like there's a manual, and you got to follow. You do this, then this, then this, then this, and then you're done. Right, and then you leave them, and then IPT has that with contracts and how long it's going to be. Right. Like they want you to see them as almost like a physician and coming back every six months to kind of check in. But um, regardless of of all those things that may or may not be helpful, insurances love that. Um, but whether whether or not those are helpful, what I do love about IPT, it's entirely focused on social aspects of the human being. It's saying that if you fix what's going on around you, you can fix yourself. And I don't think that's true, but when we are, when our clients and ourselves, when we do have a community around us of loving, supportive people, we do things with other people more often than not, we are happier, right? And sometimes the community yeah. can be the problem if we have a toxic community. So obviously finding the right people are, is important, but I think that's a really cool element of IPT. Right, well, I, it is an interesting thing that it seems so simple, um, but I remember... Jordan Peterson, I was listening to a speech about, and I, I, with that look, I'll ask you what you think. Politically, I'm not necessarily standing with Jordan Peterson, but I love his psychology. It's absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic. But sometimes it's like a simple idea that I, I heard him say this was. Um, clean your room. Clean your room. It's a good idea. Does he say make your bed or clean your room? 
And he says clean your room. Clean your, make room. your bed also. It's clean your room. Is clean your thing. room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. What he was saying was guy comes to you and he's depressed. And then you ask, you have to ask, like, do you have a job? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's just a, it's just a simple thing. I, I sometimes this happens. People come to me and they're like, I just feel miserable. And, and, and I'm, and, and I look at them and anybody could look at them and be like, you're spending 16 hours a day on your phone in your room in a basement and like <laughs> what do you expect is going to happen? Right. So even though psychology explains that like growth comes from the inside. There is yeah. this concept. Yeah. I know with guys in the house, I'll, they'll, they'll say to me, that I, I got this problem, this problem. I'm like, okay, let's go down the list. Did you speak to your sponsor? Did you go to a meeting? Right. Did you go? Like these are all outside things because sometimes we just have to build our outsides to to make pretend the way we want our insides to be. Well, I mean, even more than that is yeah. that um, seeing people and getting involved, let's do another theory, polyvagal theory as an example. It's a really cool theory. But getting involved in that ventral vagal connection, so connecting with people socially engages a part of our being that just makes us happy. We're social beings. And being engaged with other people socially just is something we need, even for introverts or people who like to be alone. You know, these are things that are just, and as just necessities of a daily basis. Things this, We just need to connect to people. You know, right. look people in the face, smile, get hugs, all these things. I mean, but it doesn't have to be that way. Right. You know, just that it's just so important. And I mean, you talking about Jordan Peterson for a second. I, yeah. I, I smiled. So I used to buy into Jordan Peterson. Now, I, this, is, this is a very long, long answer, but I'll try to shorten it a little bit. What was the question about Jordan Peterson? You just he said, no, no, just, no, I, I gave, I, I, I smiled. Oh, what's that smile? What's that smile is the question. <laughs> so I kind of bought into him hook and sinker for a little bit because he was a guy in the 21st century. And now, so his, one of his heroes is Carl Jung. Right. Um, at least he attributes a lot to Carl Jung at, I love Carl Jung. Like one of the, the reasons I got into psychology was reading Carl Jung, which is yeah. weird for someone to say. Not usually. so weird. But you know, most people don't really encounter him. They'll encounter like Freud and maybe um, hear a little bit about the, uh, maybe Horne, maybe, uh, you know, some other psychoanalysts. Well, the recovery but, world's pretty crazy about Carl Jung. Yeah, cause, I mean, because he said one thing to one person. Uh, but he's... It was enough. It was enough. <laughs> he's, he, but his, his whole theory, like he borders on so many things. He was a genius. He's a little crazy too, but he was a genius. And... So, and I also, like, really identified with myth all of my life. Like, in yeshiva, I, like, I remember once asking one of my rabbis, like, is it okay to, like, read about Greek mythology? It's about the Zara, but, like, is that okay? Mm -hmm. And, like, I mean, later it came not to matter so much to me. What did he say? Um, he said that kind of. Like, he kind of gave me, like, a, uh, not really, but okay. Okay. You know, because um, of a Zara, but, like, you're reading it for, not for Abed Zara. So, um, although I did read it for Abed Zara, too, which is fun. Okay. Um, yeah, it's... uh. It's all these elements to it, but Jung loved myth, and for him, myth was this the was archetypes. the way. Well, the archetypes are part of it, but really, yeah. is these is this like the the collective unconscious is coming out comes and so personal unconscious the way you believe that we have a collective unconscious that kind of gets passed down, which is really interesting and kind of uh, sounds more like could sound a lot a lot more um, woohoo hippy dippy than mm -hmm. it is because it does have a lot of reality to it as well. Scientifically, but it's not necessarily what you he want meant. to explain what that means. Yeah, sure. So the collective unconscious, according to Jung, there's um, things that were passed down um, through our evolution. Um, he was very Darwinian as well. Mm -hmm. And um, through our evolution, things were passed down that we kind of automatically go through. Now, he kind of believed in it also in this in this way that we're all affected by this one thing. Um, called the collective unconscious, right? But what, what's happening is as human beings, we kind of get this baggage, um, just as human beings. Some of it's baggage, some of it's not baggage, some of it's great. Um, but we get these things that we're kind of born with and it's are, are inherent to us being human that we get to almost act out. And I kind of see, and, there's, and through history, you kind of see these tendencies of humanity to consistently go through these things over and over and over again. Right. And for me, that's, that was super important. And so... Jung believed that the that the myth was the expressions of the collective unconscious, and dreams were the expression of the personal unconscious. Now he did believe in dream analysis, which is not something that I'm I buy into too much, but um, I do I really enjoyed his his writing and what he believed and like he'll quote so many like he'll quote like these. Uh, you going back to Jordan Peterson again? No, no, no. I'm talking about Jung still. Still young. Still young, but I'll get to Jordan. Um, but Jung talks about all these, all these really, I mean, he'll talk about Kabbalah and like the Mesut 
And like, it, right. he, he literally did that at an interview once randomly. I mean, considering most cool. of his friends were Jews. Yeah, he was like, like going out. Freud loved him because he was the only guy, right. the only not Jew. He's Freud's guy. He, he was Freud's like he's he's Freud, like the Shabbos guy. Freud believed that the only reason why psychoanalysis will go on is because of Jung, because he's the only guy involved. Everybody yeah. else is Jewish, and That's he's like nobody's going to listen to us Jews. That's true. Um, so he loved, and then yeah, he was heartbroken when Jung disagreed with him. But um, anyway, so Jordan was this was was this guy talking about these mythological archetypes and these figures in modern culture, and it was so cool to me. And I heard him on, on Joe Rogan and on a couple other podcasts. And I was like, right. wow, this guy's awesome. And I did a, a deep dive. And like I went into his personality stuff and his maps of meaning stuff and into his, his biblical stuff. And it was so interesting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then I started learning more and getting more in touch with myself. Mm-hmm. And I started seeing that. So there is room for him in a lot of ways. But. Also, I mean, nowadays, I mean, just to be honest, I think that he's kind of went a little bit off off the rocker at this point. There's something because different of the about political him. stuff. I guess so. Yeah, he's just he's he's been in the beginning. He was like, you know, I'll I'll, I'll be nice to people personally, like you know, because he came, got famous from this whole pronoun argument in in Bill C sixteen right, in right, Canada, right. right? But he was saying like he'll still be like nice to people, you know, and, and he, he'll refer to them by their pronouns if they'd ask. Like he be, still says that he doesn't anymore. He's he's actually argued he he went it's a completely different tune at this point. And he's been publicly just an a hole to people. Like very angry. And just like something that I just I was just it, like I got very like ugh about about him. I don't know. Right. And because I also I, I like I'm I know Sonny and I have these conversations a lot about hero worship. Yeah. I like bought it. I, I, I buy in hook and seeker to people. Right. You know, and I was like, Wow, you know, this guy I, something happened. Right. You know? But he was never all that perfect. So he has he has his place, but like, you know. That's why I, that was that was the smile. Uh, the smile, yeah. I actually think that uh, I never buy into anybody. Right. <laughs> I, I am the opposite, opposite uh, which is terrible um, because I, I literally I think maybe life has jaded me too much that all the people that we worship and admire, and I just see them as people, and I and it's it's maybe it's bad. Like I probably shouldn't. I I probably should see people. For the glory that they are, and I, I think I do. I see them for the glory that they are, but I also see them as regular people. And yeah. I, and the truth is, I see someone like Jordan Peterson, which is a very fascinating case because, man, I would love to have him on the podcast. Like, hey. oh my god, I would love to have him because, besides the fact that I think he's absolutely brilliant, I actually think he's you know he's a very kind person. Mm-hmm. I really believe that. And I believe he really started out like really wanting to help everybody. And I think yeah. he's helped more people than most people out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a, a fascinating case study. It reminds me of uh, Breaking Bad, that show. Right. Like if you could take somebody who's literally a good, uh, just to, to anybody who didn't watch Breaking Bad, but it's a show about this guy who's a teacher and he turns into like a mafia boss, basically. This is, this is not a spoiler because this is the first episode. The first episode. Yeah. yeah, he sells drugs and stuff like that. But... It, it was a show on the concept of could we take somebody who's a good person and turn them into like a monster right? and it would be realistic. And actually it's one of the things Jordan Peterson talks about is that we have this monster in us yeah. and which is fascinating because here he is a person who's a kind of popular professor who everybody loves. He puts out YouTube videos that are fascinating and people love it and it's really good. And then he took a political stand and literally, his popularity went through the roof. Through the roof, completely. Um, which, to me, is like a case study. Like, what happens if you take a guy, a normal, good person, who's intelligent and wonderful, seems to love his family, love his wife, and you speak to the way he speaks about his parents, beautiful, like he really is a genuinely good person, and put into a world of crazy, right. where all of a sudden. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people saying nasty things about him right. daily, minutely, yeah. all the time. He All of a sudden, his millions of dollars are coming in. Fame is coming in. So to me, it was like the monster like is going to come out. And also like, remembering. And where is it? So Remembering that he also struggled, and he's open about this. He struggled with depression and, and the like all his life. Right. So this is also like... It, Part of it as well, right? And at the it's same time, his wife got cancer. His daughter yeah. was sick. Yeah, his daughter always sick. Yeah, and it was wow. like, 
there was so much going on. I, I really like related to him, not in the mm. famous part, but I'm saying I related to him like this is a, just a good person trying to live a good life. Yeah. And thrown into a world where it's nearly impossible to be that. Right. I mean, he'd be right. on radio shows. I watched him on shows where he goes onto the show and they eviscerate him. They go for his throat. Right. And on everything. And they misquote him. And they mis- yeah. and, and he's yeah. just trying to say something. And he leaned into it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I honestly, I don't know what anybody else would do. Like, right. how do you this not? That's a dream. This I can true. now spread my message to everybody. But there's a, there's a fallout of what could happen. And I think he got deeply into addiction and deeply into this depression yeah. and 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 just it just it spiraled and I see and I see that angry face and I I actually I actually when I when I see that I kind of wonder when that's gonna happen to me. I don't mm. mean to say like I tell I come home at night sometimes. And I'm like, when is the time where I'm going to lose it? Like right. what? How much could I take? It's a beautiful perspective before. <laughs> I'm crazy yeah. um, where I where I go over the edge because I he, this is a guy took on took on took on and I actually think he's doing a fab, fabulous job. I don't think I yeah. could last nearly yeah. as long as him. Um, but there's a deep humanity in his anger when he I see yeah. it. OK. And when I see it, I like I'm like, oh, he's he's a person and maybe so he's we'll, missing it sometimes. Maybe he's getting we'll given the pass for being wrong and for being. Yeah. So I'm like sense. seeing it right. differently because he says some wise really wise things, really yeah. great things. I don't agree with everything he says, but right. he, he has a way of putting things in perspective that is so beautiful. And we're going mm-hmm. really far into Jordan Peterson, but yeah, I think we should back but up he's actually soon. one of the real inspirations for me to do a podcast. Okay. He really is because he... I thought Joe Rogan he, was. Joe Rogan, I want to do it like Joe Rogan, but the concept that he has is I have something to offer to the world that I've been giving mm-hmm. to like a group of college students. Right. What if I could put it on a platform and just give whatever I have, give it out to the world, like for free. He did that on his YouTube channel. And he did that on his YouTube channel. And that was more of my inspiration was what, which was um, more of the inspiration was that I just was like, there's so much goodness in the world and so much I've learned. And I want to like put it out there. And that that's, and like, it's almost feels selfish to hold on to whatever has been given to me. And that's yeah. Even the name of the podcast, right? Is a sprain storm, right? Which is, it's in my head. It's exploding. Mm. There's another reason meaning for brainstorm, but that's not really the reason for the podcast name. It's in my brain. There's a storm of right. stuff and stuff going in and coming out and right. wise people in my life that I love talking to. And anyway, we're going into a totally different topic. So what do you think about Kanye West? <laughs> I actually only recently I don't have much of an opinion on yay, yay 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 I don't have much of an opinion on yay I was I, I tried uh, listening to so he was on Lex Friedman's podcast we'll recently. take this seriously that was completely a joke but let's hear oh no 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 I just tried to listen to it I was like what the heck is going on because I, I I'm not on social media I don't have a Twitter account I have a Facebook that I don't use I mean I don't really have much around um, and um, so. Like, I didn't know what was going on in the world. I just heard that he's been saying things. I know that he's a little a, a, a little bit off. He's got stuff, some, some stuff going on. Um, right. And when I saw he was on Lex Friedman, and I heard he was doing said something anti-Semitic, I don't know, but he was on Lex Friedman's podcast. I'm like, Lex is Jewish. He's like a Soviet Jew. It'd be pretty cool to hear what's going on there. Right. I listened to like five minutes, and I just couldn't listen to him anymore. I don't know. He's too I mean, crazy. He's just, but here's the situation. Can I just mention this? Another thing? He's a guy who the same thing happened. No, but also, he, it was an artist. He did beautiful no, things. He thinks he deserves all of this, which is the weird that that's part that doesn't sit well with me. He's like, I am the best. I am God. I am. He's like, he's like, I'm an engineer. Like, <laughs> he's sitting there talking to Lex Friedman, who's a, who's, a, who's an MIT professor, right. very intelligent, very cool dude. And he's like, yeah, I'm an engineer, <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay, Kanye. Uh, yay. Well, okay. So let's, let, yeah. let uh, this was half a joke, but that in therapy, right. you know, you could say anything and it'll come yeah. back to what you're thinking. But like that idea that we're saying with Jordan Peterson, where like, and, and I'm going to bring it back to regular people as well, is like, you have these dreams in life for things to happen. And then they happen. Then they happen. 
Sometimes they happen. And there's like that 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 Chinese curse. Like you should the curse is that you should get everything you ever wanted. Right. Which is a beautiful curse. Um but it then happens. And then what happens with that? Like something like Jordan Peterson, like he was like, I wanna spread this to the world. Let's say tomorrow brainstorm podcast blows up and like millions of people listening and then everybody hates me and then some people love me and some people hate me and all of a sudden i can't walk in the street without bodyguards like imagine that happen right Right. so that happens to these two people you know kanye west he's a billionaire coming from the streets you know like he's like he's like he's everything like he couldn't like he couldn't have predicted a better like outcome like at all this is his full dream, I mean, all the dreams he ever had, and then he turned in, and and it, it it turned him crazy. Right, right. But you also have so many people that it doesn't. Does it? Which is interesting. Who? Well, I mean, I, you <laughs> bring that up. I mean, uh, what's his name? Who's that comedian? The short. Uh, Wait, let me say my let me say my uh, point about regular people because I, I I think it really messes with everybody, but. My point is, is that I think, and I once heard something like this, which is the, the, maybe the core of all sadness in the world. I heard this, uh, this professor who was talking about like happiness from Harvard. I forgot his name, Harari or something, whatever. Israeli name. You all know Harari? He's not Harvard. He was a, he... It was a Harvard guy, but okay. I forgot his name. Anyway, so he was saying that really, and maybe I'm misquoting this or saying it different or saying my own take on it. Is that really the core of all of our misery in the world is believing that if we got somewhere, mm. we would be happy. The hedonic that, treadmill. What'd you say? The hedonic treadmill. That's what it's called. Tell me what the hedonic treadmill so it's, is. It's, I never it's, heard it's it said like that. It's uh, That's not my term. I'm, I don't remember where I quote it. I mean, I know from. what both those words mean, but I yeah. don't know. So, you... so it's where we're running for the next best thing, constantly running for something to please us. And right, so so that's it's not on exactly the treadmill, it's that ne- because we never get there is why it's a treadmill, right? Because we are already there, exactly. So it's the problem is, is that we have built up like the reason my misery exists is because I don't have this, right? And then when when you get that, and then you realize the misery is still there, that's where the misery really goes through the roof. Like, that's yeah. where real sadness comes it, because exactly you actually addiction. got it. And a lot of people never get it. I Forget mean, about addiction for a second. Okay. A lot of people do, you know, they dream, well, of course I'd be happy if I had uh, $500 million. Right. And they never get it. Right. So they have in their head this, like, Mashiach concept. It's coming. It's coming. Right. And it's going to be great. And it's going to be wonderful. And they, they could kind of, like, keep going with that belief. But what happens when you get it? Right. What happens when Kanye West now has billions of dollars right. and, and, and Jordan Peterson has millions of followers and like the dream happens in a, in a smaller scale. Yeah. This happened to me. Yeah. I was, uh, I mean, first of all, I've never, I mean, most of my life at this point is a dream. Like I could never have thought as uh, somebody struggling the way I did, um, you know, going through regular yeshiva, going to, to like a community college in Kingsborough community college. Shout out. Love that school. Um, I but, call it Special Harvard. That was amazing. Such a good <laughs> school. I loved Kingsborough so much. I still love it. Got um, a great beach. Got a great beach on there. It's a beautiful campus. It's just, it's so nice. The professors are amazing. Place is amazing. Um, but going from there to New York University, right? Going to NYU with a great scholarship and graduating from a BSW, Bachelor of Social Work, and then going on to their master's program, graduating with an MSW. Like, I had somebody tell me, a therapist uh, I was seeing at that time that you referred me to, but we're not going to hold it against you. Um, <laughs> I was seeing this therapist, and uh, he uh, he told me that if if that I shouldn't go to school yet because I'm going to fail out, I should audit classes. Um, I I don't know why he thought that, but that was an impetus for me to really finally sign up because I was kind of pushing it off. And I went to school and I graduated. I mean, Kingsboro um, with a 4.0 as a valedictorian candidate. I had like every honor in the book there and it was amazing. I was like the president of the honors club. I was a nerd, you know, still a nerd, but I was in the right. really nerdy then, you know, pre- um, a Phi Theta Kappa, the honor society. I was a, a president and vice president of, I, like I did, I did a bunch there 
you know, and then and, um, and then I went on to NYU with a great scholarship, graduated summa cum laude, and then went straight on to their master's program, graduating the 4.0. Like, this was a dream to me. It's crazy that I could do that. I had no idea. People didn't believe in me, right. you know. I didn't believe in myself, and I was able to do that. And then we're, you invited me here. This is what I was going to get to, is you invited me here for Pesach to uh, help run the program just for, for, for Pesach. Right. And I heard that you were maybe looking for someone as a clinical director. And I was sitting outside. I remember where I was standing. I was standing right between the two houses that we have. Right. Um, I was talking to my wife. And I said, I heard Sonny's looking for someone. Wouldn't it be amazing if I got the job? If you offer me the job? She was like, that would be amazing. I'd love to live here. And I said, nah, there's no way. Right? And then like <laughs> two weeks later, Sonny calls me. <laughs> He's like, Shalom. <laughs> so would you like to work for us? It was two weeks later. It was yeah, about, yeah, about it two was weeks later. right there, yeah. Yeah, I was still, uh, yeah, I was still finishing up school. And it wasn't on purpose. I didn't invite you to do that. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't. I, 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 I'm, I'm not saying anything like that. But it was. It was amazing. It might have helped. It was crazy. It yeah, was, I, it was crazy to me. And then, like you know, living in a house coming from Brooklyn, I have a beautiful daughter, beautiful wife. You know, everything's amazing. Like my life is so good. I mean, obviously, there's difficulties. I'm not going to say so no. So now you, you, now you're wondering why you're still so miserable. I no, but I'm saying on a smaller scale, like these yeah. dreams did come true, and like you know, there's so we're gonna begin at the lava Chirava. I said, I said I threatened Sonny I would. Okay, um, but there's a cool story. Your background is lava. Yeah, I grew up. I grew up in Crown Heights. Right, I grew up Chabad, um, and I still identify with a lot of the underlying teachings of Chabad. Right. Um, just say, just say that. Um, but there was a, there's a story that Adin Steinsaltz, uh, Alva Shalom, right. a big a genius and, and lived in Israel. He was at the uh, he died recently. He he was in a in a yichidus. He was at a private audience with the rabbi, and basically he was complaining. He had like these th- these two jobs that he had that were full time jobs. He had another two that were coming up that were like these are all community organization stuff and big and like giving back to the community writing, I don't know, a lot of things he was doing, and they're all full-time and a lot. And he asked the Rebbe, like, he wanted to know which one which one out of the four he should take. And the Rebbe was like, no, take all of them. Right? And he, he the way he explains it, he said that he took all of them. And he said, what happens is, that when you add on all these things, you change and adapt right. to do all of them. Right? Obviously, this is not for exactly how, he obviously had all the support he needed, and the love he needed, and everything he needed to do that. Right? So all that was obviously there first. Uh, Because that's super important that that's there. Otherwise, that wouldn't happen. I'm not saying to go take on like a million things and decide that all of a sudden everything's going to be amazing. Right. But we are able to adapt to so much. And it's amazing what we can do. And like for me, like I'm taking, I I have a lot on my plate. Thank God. All of it's a blessing. I don't think, and I, I wake up every day and I get to be excited to go to work. I don't wake up like smiling. Because I do have to, like, I, I, I do a lot in the morning to get myself to baseline. Right. But, uh, but like, I still, I'm excited to go to work. I'm excited to show up here. I'm excited to have my clients one-on-one. I'm excited to run this companion network I do for Nishamas. I'm excited to bring those speaking, uh, those, those, uh, those, uh, those presentations to the schools about addiction for prevention. Right. All these things that I get to do now, this, the, it, it, living a dream, it's amazing. <sighs> Yeah. I, I almost want your life. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Sonny's got the most amazing life. <laughs> I, I like my to... life. But I could tell you, and I this is very important. I'm not sure if I said this on a podcast. There has never been a morning in my life where I've been excited to get up. Me too. They're like, never. Never. I always want to stay sleeping. Have you ever, sleeping. like, been go- going to Israel and, like, had to get up early? Like, been excited because you're going to no. Israel? No, not even that. I'm like... Darn, I got a, I got a kid, I got, I, got, uh, I wake up, I used to, when I first got married, I literally, I realized how nasty I could be in the morning, like, just because I'm so crabby, I actually made it that I don't talk in the first hour, my wife is like, well, you're not talking, I'm like, I'm not talking for an hour, because anything that comes out of my mouth is going to be mean, <laughs> I'm not going to mean it. I was going to be offensive and terrible. Yeah. I would literally, I think for like a year or so, I did not, and I was lucky because I had a commute in the morning. I wouldn't answer a phone. I wouldn't call anybody. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I'd be like, I'd just leave the house, be mm. like, I'm not talking to anybody um, for, the, for, for the first hour. But I have never gotten up 
and I find this amazing. And people are always giving me really good advice. You should eat better. You should uh, work out, and you should meditate. Shooting all over you. I've right <laughs> recovery. Yeah, shooting all over. All the shooting. Um, so I I have never found a solution. And I think that's fine. I don't know why I'm bringing it up, but it's it's fascinating because yeah, you mentioned so it. Weird. Like, I could get up and have a perfect life, and for some reason, I just do not want to wake up Me in the too. morning. Me I, too. I like it's to be so, hidden. It's so annoying. And so what I got to do, I got to do things like I do like I do Wim Hof breathing, and I take a cold shower, and then I meditate. Right? These are all things I do just to get to baseline to not blow up at people in my life. Right. <laughs> You know, it's so fascinating because I, I, I'm constantly, constantly trying to figure out why um, this is a little philosophical, I guess. But like and, and many people have talked about this, but why we are like as the world gets better and better, it seems to be harder and harder. Like mm. I don't you know, I'm not a believer that like it used to be better. And I, I do talk about like community was a little better, but I do, I definitely don't think there's ever been a time period ever that's been better than no, this, I agree. including Judaism. Absolutely. Like a lot of the, you read the Sadoras. I do not believe that there's no. Eurydice Sadoras. I think we're going up and up and up. One of my biggest complaints yeah. about with that is like, so I'll be, I'll be sitting there. I was sitting there in a, in a show in a, at a Fabrangan or whatever, because I, 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 I did grow up Chabad and somebody was just saying how, Oh, there's this idea. Like this was in El a couple weeks, like a month ago. Um, and they're talking about how like this idea, how the last 12 days of El are like corresponding to the months. Like Val, Val Shanto said this and that you should do Chuva for each month. You should sit down and think about what we did that month. And they're like, oh, how can I apply it to me? And what they said was, oh, like, find out an idea of that month. And he, the guy who was saying it gave an example of some a rabbi who would, like, study all the sikhahs that the Baba Rebbe said from that month. It looks like a crazy thing for someone to do to do every, for a day. But, right. like, it was it, it bugged me so much. It's like, no, maybe you should actually try to think about what you did. Maybe that's what they mean. Maybe what what does that mean? Maybe you're capable of sitting down and thinking about what you did last year. And, and maybe trying to be better a better person because of it, right? right. Instead of saying that it's not, like, there's a, this is a, a little rant about Chabad for a minute. Yeah. But, like, there was this thing that Chabad had really nice. So, this is about Judaism in general, Chabad in particular also. I've seen it in Chabad a lot. But Judaism had this beautiful esoteric mysticism as a part of it. It was a, ka a Kabbalistic, uh, the Kabbalah and Kabbalistic studies and Hasidus, right? And this is an esoteric contemplative practice that could bring someone to really, really cool places in themselves and in the world. And there's practices that are like prescribed there of what to do. And then we don't do it. And then say, oh, that's not, that's not applicable to us. What does that and, mean? So as an example, yeah, as an example, like Chabad, it's, I'm going to give this as an example because it's pr pretty particular. Um, Chabad is, you know, Chabad's known for the Mitzayim, for going out and for Shlichos and all that, which the Baba Chirabah did change in some ways. It wasn't there before, but the basis of Chabad Chabad stands for Chachma Bina and Dat, which is um, intuition, um, understanding, right? Really, like, really getting in the weeds of, uh, of understanding something and connecting deeply to an idea. It's really a contemplative practice. It's an actual practice. And that people are supposed to um, think and contemplate about their relationship to God and the universe. And the result of that is to be more loving and kind towards others and to have a better relationship with your higher power. And if you do it, you get there. And a, a part of that is thinking, uh, is, is sitting in contemplation for time, specifically before davening. Mm. And then davening in a specific contemplative manner that people don't do. It's so weird to me. Like, this is what Chabad is. And I've been studying and trying to see it, and nobody can answer me what this means. And there's like, there's, there's these little, like, and, and I know, and I've, I've seen that it's discussed that these were things that were supposed to go from like teacher to student, right? Not supposed to be really published because there's a lot of, that you can that you can fool yourself on and, and kind of go down these weird trips, and and it's and, and Chabad is really wants people to be more real, but it's kind of lost on them, and it's so weird to me. And like I tried it actually this week. I sat in Shulan Shabbos. I'm like I'm gonna just try doing this. Like I don't know what I'm doing. What I do you mean doing? What do you do? So, um, really, I got a little bit idea of what contemplation means from this guy, a really cool guy, John Verveke, um, Awakening for the Meaning of Crisis. It's a really cool uh, um, lecture series. It's amazing. But discussing contemplation, contemplation really means thinking about the macro. So pinpointing yourself, and you can do it secularly as well, easily. 
me and kind of like branch out to where I am, like to the community. Right. And like to the, to, to, you know, so like for me, from here, right. To the house, to the village, right. To, uh, to our village community. And then to like, to, the, to Muncie. Right. Then kind of branch out to, well, to what are you York, doing? What are you just thinking about this? Just thinking, thinking about, about contemplating and really thinking deeply about how big the universe is. Oh, okay. Right. And then in Chabad, it's really thinking about how big God is, is the okay. idea. Right. For myself, kind of branching out. And that causes automatically for someone to have a certain, engender certain feelings of humility, of love, of connection, of connectivity, oh, man. of awe as well. Yeah. All those things come from this, right? There's right. Different, different nuances you can have in contemplative thought that can lead to different places, which is really cool also you could play with. So you could sit in, in like davening, for example, and applying it to myself. This great God, what does this mean? What does this mean to me? It's my problems today. It was a really cool experience, but I just don't see it happening. So that's just the Chachma part? So no, no. So the, the whole thing, the whole Chabad is because, so it's a Kabbalistic idea that there are 10 soul faculties or 10 faculties of the human being or 10, 10 soul powers maybe. Yeah. 10 ways the soul expresses itself in descending order. And the first one is intuition. It's like, where does the idea come from? That's Chachma, right? right. So that's connecting to the seminal idea, right? Which is also connected to seeing something. Mm -hmm. So you could see the whole idea at once. Right then, bina is the contemplation, getting into the weeds of of building that right or understanding something. Right, and das is how you connect it to yourself. It's, per, it's how it changes your perception, which leads directly to the rest of them, which we can also discuss if you if you would want to. But all the spheres yeah. and the all the spheres, what they mean. So this is arachampen, and this is no, no, this is after arachampen. This arachampen is kesser. Arachampen is in is is, is the top is, three. So arachampen is the place that that that. It's like it, Arachampin is the will. It's the place where this comes from. It's the place source of intuition. Okay, so I'm gonna okay. I don't wanna go deeply into Kabbalah, okay. although I really, really love it. Yeah, we can in do some it. senses. Yeah. Although my experience with Kabbalah is is uh, is uh is is rough because I spent a a bit of time learning Kabbalah and what I found it to be incredibly uh I had much more questions when I was done after a little over a year of studying than when I started. Like it was, it really maybe made me doubt more things than I could have imagined. But yeah. that's a different, that's a that's no, a different but, topic. I, but that's also part of because the Kabbalists were people who are having experiences and documenting it. Th th which is why they they weren't philosophers trying to tell you the, the truth of everything the exact to, to the exact nth degree, right? They give an example of art, or like light, which is it's not light, it's not energy. Like God is an energy, right? And, and according to Kabbalah, it's just it's an example because they're using these metaphors to try to engender an experience. Is the idea right? That's what I'm saying. It's not just a discipline. It's a discipline. It's not just a study. Yeah, but I will tell you on a more practical sense, and you should know this. And I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but our entire philosophy of this house is built on Chabad. The words. Okay. And you don't know it's. So I've given lectures on this, and it's really. It's, I'm okay. interested that you said that. Is that we have three levels of growth in this right. house, and the first level is full unconditional love, which is mm -hmm. chachma is not something you earned. Right. It's intuition. It just right. comes. It's a gift from above, and that our first level is just enormous amount of unconditional love that's right. coming for no reason, and that's right. such a important piece here. Just because you exist, you're loved and wonderful and beloved. Uh, d d d on that point, one of the coolest parts of working here has, has been that the main work is in myself to learn how to love people more. Right. It's such a cool job. It's so cool. And you have to do unconditionally. Yeah, exactly. When a guy does something that you literally want to murder him for, like, and yeah. but you have to find deep inside yourself, like, what, like, how, how does this person... How can I love him more? Just get more love. Yeah. And an addict in, and everybody, and that's the thing about addiction, is that it's just a caricature of all of us. Like, it's yeah. such an explosion of, like, if we were on the least healthy part of ourselves, we would look like addicts. So we all need this. But the, the first stage is just pure, unadulterated, un, you know, love. And it's what our biggest criticism we get is that we're not so focused on what I call the second stage. Right. And the second stage is about the work. And there's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of rules here, and there's a lot of work, but we're not highly focused. I mean, I, I don't have a week where a parent or two is not yelling at me that I, and you've had it too, now you're experiencing it, where it's like, he's not going to enough of this, he's not going to enough of this. 
what I've experienced and what you're experiencing now, I think, unless you want to disagree, is that when you're fully loved, you just go to Bina. It doesn't, it's like an automatic thing. Guys have turned to me and say, I want to work. Yeah. It went from like, don't make me wake up to like, how do I go and do the work? I right. want to do the work. That only comes when you've felt the safety. And then the DOS part, which is level three, which is giving back. It's the connection. So it's I, the inter. I, I would even say this is really just the, in, in, in Kabbalistic terms, would be the right, left, and middle side. Right. Right. It's all of that. It's just. Well, I see it as the right, left, and the baby. Right. I mean, the baby of the right, right. left. Is the, the right, the baby. The interdependence. And that's the interdependence that. where you share it. And it's only yours when you share it. And then yeah, that's exactly. the community piece that comes back. So it's uh, that. Erchach Mubina Das is so powerfully ingrained in this program. I mean, the 12 steps also has these Absolutely. three steps. So it's pretty incredible that uh, so many different disciplines have come up with this. But what what has found what I have found the most frustrating is that everybody wants to skip to level two. Yeah, because we we're in this in this world where people value the level two more than they value level one. We're in a world where it's all about how many degrees do you have, right? Right? How many things have you done? How much money is in your bank account? That's what it looks like to people, yeah. right? And that's what the messages that we're given, you know. Through but the I, I agree with that. that. I do think level two is impressive. No, I just yeah. don't think you'll get to level two until you have level one. But it's also not the most important. To me, it's not. It, it might be. It might be the most important. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Meaning, like I, I'm, right. right I'm right. agnostic about what's more important. Right. I don't have. I don't care. What right. I do know is that if you don't have a job and you don't have money and you don't, and no one's gonna marry you. You're not right. a. Right. You're not like a. What, what was that guy in the internet? High value man. Like. You know, like <laughs> What was that? There's a guy everybody hates. That, oh, um, I know you're talking about. The bald guy. He's yeah. like a kickboxer. Oh, oh man, yeah. that's a great topic to bring oh, up. Oh, that's fine. Um, what's that's his name? Fine. I forgot his name. Who cares? Anyway, he's like high value man our, gets our a woman. Our mutual friend Mendy really likes him. Oh, boy. So <laughs> what I'm saying is like oh, you're Andrew not Tate. a Andrew, Andrew Tate. Tate, right. Yeah. You're not a high value man until you really did level two. And th that's true. No, like, but, but it's I not. Had, I, you, you are a high value person just by existing, and that's what we show you in the in the in level one. But the world, the, the world does not see that. And but that, that, I think that might be a problem with the world more than it's a problem with with because it, it used to not be that way. I honestly ways. believe it's a collection of both. Okay, I think that that there are a lot of people that feel super confident about themselves and they feel full, but they haven't done anything in the world, and nope. that's great. Yeah, that's and there what I'm are saying. people who have done a lot but feel empty inside, and that's great also because they've done a lot. I think if you don't have the connection to both, you're just not a full person. Right? No, no. So I definitely do agree that the the outgrowth of what automatically what a person will do is being creative and being involved and being in the community. These things are going to happen, right? A lot of level two will happen, right? But um, these people at level that are only at level two. What often happens is they, they burn out. No, they crash. And they burn. they crash, or they or they you, they end up in places that needing a place like this because they can't function. Right, right. They need that love. You have people like you have people like I mean, it's an amazing human being like Robin Williams, right? Who was just miserable and he did so much and he cared so much about people. Just an amazing human being, right. but he did not feel that love. And he writes about it. You could, you could look at look at what he writes and what was going on. He just didn't feel like a high value person right. because he wasn't getting that love, which is amazing because you could because people think that if a million people say they love you, you're gonna feel loved. Right. But it's it's you have to believe that person genuinely loves you, and that means that they have a choice to love you or not love you, and they've right. chosen to love you. An right. autonomous now is that what happened? We're back to free will. Oh, no. Should I say my free will joke? You can say your free will. You were saying before, I'm going to say my free will. Let's see if anybody gets my joke. Uh, you were saying that you wanted to write a thesis on free will. So I said I wanted to write a three uh, a thesis on free will too, but I couldn't. <laughs> that was my whole joke. Yeah, it's amazing. And you were like, <laughs> and you were, you just kept going. Like, I just glossed over this. Totally missed it. And I was like, that was a joke. <laughs> In my defense, I didn't eat breakfast yet, so that's part of it. I am I'm with you yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. The Chabad thing came up and yeah. 
But I, that is one of my, my, my like pet peeves is like, I don't know like why everybody in this world is so desperate to idealize. Um, mm. It's just, it just, I, I, I can't really get it. So um, the close I get it is my wife. This is the, this is part of like well, this is one of our, the, our what we were talking about with Carl Jung also right, I believe that this is something in human nature that we do we idealize people, um, and this happens in throughout history, right? And I'm gonna get pilloried for this, but you know like it's it's just like people did with Jesus, right? Yeah. They have this figure because people need someone that they can relate to. That's that's everything, right? So people do this even though they're just human, and that's what people do with gurus. And that's what people, like, this is the weirdest way I got to understanding how Chabad treated the rabbi. I didn't like it. And this is growing up Chabad and then kind of leaving right. for a while, leaving religion for a while and all that and kind of getting in touch with other, other places and other things. But there's one of my, one, one of my spiritual teachers, not, I don't know him personally, but he was a really cool person named Ram Das, mm -hmm. right? Um, who, who was a Harvard psycho, a psychology professor and a therapist who tripped out on psychedelics and then ended up going to India. I met a guru there. And he has a really, a, like, really cool teachings. I don't like a lot of this, like, mystical, weird stuff that, oh, this guy told me my whole entire life by seeing me. I don't really like that kind of stuff. So it, right. it means a lot that I actually like Ram Dass. And he, he has just one line that he says. Is, I love it. He came back from India um, with, like, long beard. Um, didn't have much hair, but whatever hair he had was long. And he had beads on and the robes. And somebody's like, Ram Dass, aren't, what's with all this? Aren't you Jewish? It's like, eh, I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but he, he said he, his relationship to his guru was like a paradigm for his relationship with the universe. So like, I don't know if he, I think he believed his guru was perfect. I don't know. Right. But I kind of like, I was like, oh, the way he treats his guru is like people treat the, the Baba Chareva. Right. Now it made a lot more sense to me. And one of his, one of my favorite lines from him is that anything that's going on in his life is basically God and drag. You know, like this. Just I swear that to me. It's it's so it's so powerful. I love it. It's so when anything's going on, right? This idea that uh, this Ashkacha practice, God is everywhere. God is orchestrating everything, every to the last detail of everything. Right. right. So when anything happens, it's God in drag. God is dressing up as whatever this is, and He's playing a prank on you, right? And He's getting you to get angry so you can start working on your anger, right? It's Ram just Ram Dass says this. Rihanna says this. It's it's so powerful. When he said it that way, because I heard it other ways. When he said it, God, it's, it's God and drag or his guru and drag. I was like, oh, I love this, right? Because for me, that's what it is. It's yeah, old. but it seems to be so deeply ingrained in us. When we talk about the story of getting the Torah, and then forty days later, they're serving a calf. Like they saw, like in the sky, that Moses, their guru, um. You know, this is one of the Madrashim that they saw him that he died. Yeah. And then they were like, how could we connect to God without, without a middleman? Mm -hmm. And I want to say this. I don't understand it. Am so, I like an outlier? I, no, I don't think because you're an outlier Because I, I, I literally, I find that any idealizing of any person is going to let me down. And I'm like, why would I want to idealize someone? There is only one person to, to so, idolize. That would be God. It's so I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even arguing that we should yeah. idolize. I'm just saying that we do. And it's a natural human tendency. I don't understand it. And this guy yesterday was saying to me, he was saying to me, listen, Hitler never killed anybody. I know we're going to bring in Hitler. <laughs> He's like, he just, yeah, 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 on the, on the mic. And everybody went and did. They're the evil people. And he... Whoa. Yeah, they didn't have to listen to him. They have free will. <laughs> they could go on. He was really making this argument. Now, I was disturbed by the argument. Yeah. But the truth is, if you really break down the argument, it's it's not 100% wrong. Why the heck oh. are all these people, free will, why are they choosing to listen to some yeah, yeah, yeah guy do, do on really the mic? Do you really want me to go on my free will uh, tirade right no, now? No, I don't want you to go okay, on the free will you keep, tirade. You keep doing this free will I keep doing you. the free will thing. Sorry. Yeah, I don't want to go so philosophical. But Hitler was tapping into their, their collective unconscious. He, would collect, he was tapping into what they wanted to hear. Right, he was he was just their mouth, and we see it. We see it with yeah. Trump. We see it. We see it with leaders. Yeah, and to the point where I love. How hold on, Trump and Hitler in the same sentence. Why That's not? Amazing. They're very powerful people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, no, what I'm saying is like people will if they tap into who you are, they'll just listen to whatever the heck you say. Like it's right. it's. A, but we're at a point where a leader just saying something. 
and everybody listening, he's evil. Right. Because so deeply in our unconscious is that we need a leader that, like, then he's in, he's in charge. He didn't do anything. No, but I think... Nobody had to listen to him. No, no, no. So I don't... So, But that, that's getting into this atomized, like, we're all, we're all independent entities that don't really connect and... And and influence each other. Yeah. Right. So, there's it, it, saying Hitler was um, just the mouthpiece doesn't make him less evil, right? But it does. It doesn't. The, the well, same it, is culpability if a guy the just the if a Nazis. guy just ran around and he wrote Mein Kampf and he made speeches and then nothing happened, he would still be evil. You think you'd be as evil as oh, killing no, no, no. everybody he's ever no. got killed? He would just be a nut. No, absolutely, but he's an evil nut, right? And there's a problem with people with people saying that. But when when other people listen to you and, and there's influence, right? Who's the, the, that book? Influence. Uh, what's his name? My brother loves that book. Influence. Yeah, influence and persuasion. Two books written by. Ah, I'm getting. I'm not getting the right name. He's he's just uh, he was a uh, I think he was a therapist. I think I know guy. which book it is, but I'm yeah, trying. To, it's a very I, like I from the sixties or seventies. I think it's one of those like like seminal books. Right. Um, but people have influence over others and we're not, we're not in a vacuum. So what we do does influence others and what others do influences us. That's part of the interconnection that we have. Right. So it's not saying that he's responsible for what everybody did, right? Everybody's responsible, but they're all responsible, including the person who was the one saying you should do it. Right. He's not as culpable. He is maybe not as Well, he's the most say. evil of everybody. No um, one's pointing at another o- guy. Only be, there are people who were, were pointing at Himmler. And uh, okay. and, 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 uh, but we, and, and the, or people orchestrated it because people had to be involved. He had to say when he said do it, people did it. So if he would have said go build um, houses for the homeless, right? I mean, I mean, maybe not. <laughs> that would have been cool if people went and didn't they imagine a Nazi war machine going just building people home, uh, houses and like and and like, yeah. and like and like and like giving people things and and cooking for others. That'd be amazing if Hitler did something like that. Right, and, and there, awesome are, there have been people that have done great things like yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I wish it was to the to the to the scale. If we could reach as many people as the Nazis didn't hate, if love would be. I beautiful. think we could, I think we could argue that that has happened. It's happening, and some, uh, some people do it. It's we need not more of it. so recognizable, right? I wish it was. I mean, Abraham Lincoln freed all the slaves. Slavery yeah. was done after that. That's yeah, pretty kind of. Yeah, freaking amazing. I don't know what his reasoning was. He definitely wasn't. To no, free no, free no. The I slaves. mean, I, I meant, I meant uh, with slavery being gone, but there's still slavery in the world, which sucks. But in the Western not world, it's done. It's it's there. We still find slaves uh, here and there. You'd be surprised. You could look up the statistics on. Yeah, it. I know. Crazy, I know. I've gone. I just, went into this it, it, YouTube just, world. Yeah, it's still there, but. but yeah, yeah, no, no, I definitely hear you. It's not institutionalized no, slavery. Absolutely. Uh, it's That's, not kind of slavery in the same way it was anymore. I could probably think of some other great things that happened. Yeah, no, but, for sure. The world's a much better place than it was. But I don't know and how we got off that. this, but it's it's it amazing Hitler. how... It's all Hitler's fault. It's all Hitler. But I, I the amazing thing is that we are, like, forced to listen to somebody, like, for some reason, like... That person is culpable for us doing something is to me crazy. So I was arguing yeah. with this guy. I'm like, you're crazy, dude. The guy's nuts. He convinced everybody. And like, I'm assuming that all these people are going to follow along. Anyway, I don't know how this topic has anything to do with what we want to talk about. I have about. no idea. I don't even know it's what fine. we want to talk about. I think we're done talking, but <laughs> done? <Finish laughs> no, I don't know. I'm not done talking. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. I, the truth is, most of our conversations, if we talk long enough, are going to look like this. Right. Right, and that's nice. Some philosophical. I, I don't get to do a lot of my philosophical stuff very often. I just, uh-huh. I, I, uh, I throw it in once in a while. Um, and I could tell you the difference that I used to take more stock in all these philosophical things, and I think I've come to a place where at this point in my life, and I'm sure it'll change again, is that is that I think everybody has found a, a tiny pinpoint of truth somewhere. Right. We've discussed and, this. Right. Yeah. And they and they've and they've grabbed it and they've turned it into something. And like yeah. when I'm looking at the like the you know like when you have like I had a professor that always told me like there are people that are great at coming up with theories on how to help people and then there are people that are great at helping people and they're rarely the same person. Right. So Everybody, every time you come up with a new theory of like, this is the new psychology, this is the new thing, 
that is the only way that works. That's like, you know, like you were saying, the big, right. the yeah. big T and the small T. Like, this is the big T truth. Like, this is the right. way. Like, and those things come out, and everybody's like gung-ho crazy about it, and this is it. And I think that the lack of humility in all these, like, belief that this is the answer. I see it in myself, too, because, like, I run a program, and I'm, like, so sure that this is the right program. Yeah. But the humility that I have, that sometimes I look at other programs that are almost, like, a like opposite of this program. And somehow they're having successes also, even if it's right. one or two successes. I'm like the humility of like knowing that there's so much out there and we're all tapping into a tiny bit of truth. So I don't get hung up on anything because I'm like, Oh, this is great for now. But like, what else is there? There's right. so much more. Right. So that's why, that's where I am um, also like, we have also a little bit of a disagreement philosophically there is I think that many of these places, not they get a little bit of truth, but they're one of the true ways, right? That there are many ways to get there. Many ways to get to the same place that we need to get of wholeness and being and, and being loved and all those things and being a good human being. Right. There's so many ways. And I think that there's many different ways, right? And different religions also tap into different ways of doing it, right? And that's what they're, we're all just trying to get. And I mean, a big part of it is to stop arguing, Right, who's who has the best way, and really trying to figure out. Well, maybe that's know, part of the truth is that we argue. Oh, it could be the same way that we all believe in Jesus in some way. Maybe no. What I'm saying right. is, I don't. I, mean, know. I didn't mean we all believe in Jesus. I don't I mean, know that people, we all believe in Jesus. People, always, people like to idolize others is what I meant there. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, is that maybe the only way to come to the truth is through arguing. I actually, right. you, I literally put this in YouTube last night. Sometimes I don't Google things, I YouTube them because I want to see what people say. And I wrote, is it realistic? This was, a, I don't know why. It was like 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm on my way home, and my brain is flying around. losing my. I'm losing my mind about something because this thought just like looping in my head. And I just, I wanted to hear what other people thought. And I wrote, is it realistic to have no war? Mm. Like just right. Like what right. is a theoretical possibility that people would just not murder each other? Right. Now I put that in YouTube, and nothing came up on the theoretical ones. Everybody just talked about Ukraine and Russia. No, no Marxism. I'm, I may just be bad at typing in what I want to know, but there was nothing. There was not like he, nobody was saying anything. So I, I gave up and I moved on. I figured I'll go into it, but I'd never really heard a philosophy that said there's no war. It's, right. It's it really is even a utopian world. It's like as oh. long as you do our utopian world, then right. there won't be any war. And if you look into all the, I mean, utopia does mean doesn't exist, right? It's a place. Utopia is a place that doesn't exist. That's the literal definition, right, of those words. But like you look into, I was reading at Marxism not as a utopia that's going to work, but actually Marx believed that we're that we that conflict. He so he was a student of Hegel, and Hegelian theory was thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Right. I mean, there's a lot more to Hegel, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't claim to understand all of Hegel at all. But there was, they have a thesis, something against it, and then you have the synthesis of both. So he, he was dialectical materialism. So it's only material. There's no spirituality there that Hegel had, and he kind of believed that we have the class war, right? We have the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. versus the proletariat, and there's going to be war constantly, right? And there's going to one's going to win, and then it's going to become. It's like that. What, what's that line? Good time. Uh, bad times make strong people. Strong people make good times, mm -hmm. and good times make weak weak people. Right, right, and kind of that cycle. Um, but that's kind of how he believed that he believed things would be. He was more prescriptive, right, descriptive than than prescriptive. He wasn't yeah. saying what should happen in his philosophy. According He's to saying many, what will happen. According to many, not I'm, I'm not a Marxist philosopher, but many Marxist philosophers would say this, right. So he wasn't calling for a revolution necessarily. He's saying there will be a revolution. Right, and then you had Leninism and Stalinism and, and, and Trotsky. No, but see, I, I don't think there'll be a time period where everybody will agree. Right. Could we not kill each other if we don't agree? Like, is it possible? Like, I, I was listening to, I, I watch sometimes, like, debates of, this is another Jordan Peterson thing. I was watching a debate with him and, uh, and a Muslim cleric or whatever, this Muslim right. guy. Um, and they're both incredibly intelligent. And at Do some point... you know point, which Muslim guy it was? I don't remember. Oh, whatever. Okay. I'll show it to you later if I can find it. Um, anyway, at some point in the debate, um, it wasn't a debate. It wasn't a debate. It was a conversation. And at some point, 
um, ju- uh, this guy, this cleric, started getting like really fired up about like what's the purpose of the world, what's this, and you know like what do you believe and everything, and if you don't have a purpose, you're nothing, and you know he's going into like. Kiruv, you know, like, right. you know, like the Kiruv arguments, like if you, you know, like this is the purpose. And and at some point I, I was feeling something. And then Jordan Peterson said exactly what I was feeling. He's like, you know, I was really enjoying the conversation before more than this. Like I started right. to glaze over when you start trying to convince me right. your view. Right. He's like before we were all trying to find some similarities so that we could get along. Now you're telling me that you have a view and I got to take that view and it's like, and you're asking me for an exact answer and exactly. And I'm like, now I'm bored. Right. It's not my goal. I, my goal is not to change you to be this or be that. I want to get along with you. I want to hear your ideas. You should hear my ideas maybe, but either way, let's have peace. Yeah. And I feel that way so much. Like where is the peace in the world? And I see it. I'm going to bring it around to this podcast a little bit, and then we'll have one more question, and then we'll move on because we're already going way over. But in the Jewish world, I, you hear all these different like uh, views and this and that, and I'm, and I'm just looking at it and going, well, everybody's right. right. Everybody's right. Right. Um, everybody's wrong. <laughs> it's it's the, the yes but. Um, right. I would like to know if there's a way that we don't have war. Right. I want to know if I could sit down, and I hopefully on this podcast I get to bring on people with really different views than me eventually, and like to sit down and just, and we're talking about it in a Jewish community. It's small, tiny. There are thousands of views. Absolutely. So if this world really evolves to the place where we realize that the views are not going to stop, but how do we get along? I think that's like becoming a serious mission. And we were building this our village here. You know, like there are tons and tons of different people in this yeah. village. And we're all figuring out how each one of us is important to each other. That's really right. what a village is. You know, I'm not just accepting you for who you are. And I'm not tolerating you because tolerating means you're below me and I'm tolerating right. you. I am recognizing that you being here is essential for me right. to exist. Right. That's what a village is. So, like, I guess that's my mission. So, there's yeah. a to to bring this out more philosophically as well. There's a there's a beautiful book by an author, Jonathan Haidt, He's right. a professor in NYU. Um, he's a social psychologist. He has a lot of interesting views. I really like his views. He has a book called The Righteous Mind, and it's all about why good people disagree. Right. He talks about a lot of reasons, but what he basically says is that a lot of it is born, a lot of it's just going to be there. But we need it. If America was just run by conservatives, we'd come to a standstill and there'd be no growth, no nothing, no change. Yeah. And if it was just by liberals, we'd be all over the place where we wouldn't even have anything. There wouldn't be a specific thing. Yeah. be so open that there'd be, right? So we need both together and we need both to argue and to come to compromise somewhere in between some this way, some that way. And it's very slow and there's a lot of gridlock and a lot of problems. But what happens is, is eventually you get to much better places. Yeah. Right. Cause you could say someone, let's help all the homeless people, but let's also make sure that we have the budget for it and helping others. Right? right. So there's ways of balancing everything, right? How can we help the most addicts as we can while actually helping them and not getting so big that we can't. Right. right? It's always, you kind of have this push and pull. Okay, I could go on forever with your geekiness, with all your nerdy uh, <laughs> book it. smart stuff. I love it. I definitely go there. Um, although not too many people know how deeply I go into that area because I like gotcha. to keep things simple. Looking at your bookcase, though. I mean, uh, this is only some of your books. This is some of my books. You have like five bookcases here loaded. I'm a little bit nerdy like yeah. that as well. But I want to ask you one last question, which I ask a lot of people, Yeah, which is like, what is your... Like if you could get something out to the world, now you're talking to lots and lots of people. Um, what would be your message that you could get out there? So this is the last podcast you're on, which you won't. Yeah, be. yeah, I hope not. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, you told me you're gonna ask me that question, and I decided not to think about it because I'm not gonna get an answer Good. that's gonna be adequate at all. So okay. I'm gonna try to go off the cuff on this one a little bit, but. Um, a little bit of more of, of my philosophy in general, which is really, um, you know, try 
Oh, this is so hard. This is actually a really hard one. It's really hard. It's really difficult. I'm glad I, no one's ever I, asked me this. I don't have one message <laughs> for the world, but a message for the world is obviously, you know, um, giving people others, uh, giving other people and giving others the room and space to be themselves and loving them as they are would be a very good thing if we could do that. And then, um, you know, that, I mean, I, I guess that's a pretty good message. That's, that's not my only one. message, but it's not my message. But it's a pretty cool message. And it's I think a pretty cool should, message. Uh, just try to love someone a little bit more today. It would be a good thing. I'm thoroughly enjoying talking to you. I feel like we should just keep going. I don't know yeah. that. Uh, I just feel like we have a day and my phone keeps ringing. Does, does the conversation ever end? I mean, we just continue every time, you know? It ends on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, that's true. It ends on the podcast. As you and Ellie said when you first did the couple, first couple you guys did, you know, to be continued every Saturday night, right? Yeah. It never happened. Never happened. <laughs> it never happened. We're like, we're going to do this every <laughs> All Saturday. All the time. All the time. Uh, yeah. We'll see. We'll do, if we get a chance, we'll do it again. I really Absolutely. love it. All right. I will I will do one more thing. Do you have any questions for me? What is your message for the world? No, no, that's <laughs> no, cheating. That's that. cheating. No, but Although is, I kind of said it. I do want everybody to get along. There you go. But but I, the, the real question that I would ask, though, is yeah. um, to new people in this field, people coming to help people, people who aren't in there for 23 years already, 25 years already, um, maybe not as jaded, but not as experienced. What what words of wisdom do you have quickly, like that you could give someone in the next thirty seconds, right? Thirty seconds, really, really something that you would say could shape them for their for the professional and personal life as a helper. This is a very very good question. This is coming from a new helper. It is coming from a new helper. I'm trying to think how I failed and how I, and how I succeeded and what it was that did it. Um, so I okay, okay. Here we go. Let's see. We have time. Look at your watch. No, I just realized that I, you have an appointment. I, I had one. It's okay. It's all right. Um, I would say this. When I started this, when I started out early, it really. It defined my identity, the amount of people I helped, the, the superstar personality that I came out with and I was ready to change the world. And I was getting so much out of it and it really, um, it really like filled me like in a certain sense. And I think it was somewhat artificial. Um, and, and I did have a collapse at some point where I was like, where am I in this process? Um, I had my wife for years telling me something that I, I, and I don't even know if I still understand it, but she tells it to me constantly, and I think it's one of the reasons why I'm still going. <laughs> and that is, um, that is that to, that being amazing in the world, the outside external world is not better than being amazing on the inside world. Mm. It's not, they are not in competition with each other. Mm. One's not more impressive than the other. Being amazing is being amazing. And that's what she's told me. And, and I grew up with, if you're not changing the world and you're useless, you're, 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 you're worthless. Mm -hmm. If you're not really making a real splash and changing the entire world. And that's how I feel and how I felt. So I think if I come down to advice is that you, you don't get lost in only the career, do the best mm. job you can do in the career. But if you want to get lost somewhere, get lost in your personal life, mm. get lost with your husband or wife, with your family, like, dive so deeply into who you are as a person and give it your all at work. But it's what defines you is the people that love you, the people that are around you, who you are to the people you are loving to. Um, I, so many times I see people and this is going to sound cliche, but like they treat the world better than they treat their family. And it, to me, it's crazy. Like mm -hmm. um, it's crazy and I've done it but it's always been accidental and I've always apologized, but it's crazy um, to think that. So I don't want to say balance 
because I hate the word balance. Um, <laughs> the reason I hate the word balance is because we're always out of balance. Yeah, you know, we're always okay. one way or the other. But I could say that when you see the seesaw going down too far the other way, like start climbing the other, like try mm-hmm. to like, you know, like if you're doing too much work, like try to get back to where you are. Um, that's for people new in the field. I definitely, yeah. um, I'm asking you one more question. Uh, just on that, I want to comment on that. No, <laughs> please. But uh, to comment on that, one of the beautiful, the two some of the most beautiful things about this job is number one, I get to work with people that I love and that love me and that, and, and my client, and, and it's all about love in every which way. But the other thing is that I, this is a job that I get to go home in a few minutes. I'll be able to go home and spend about an hour of uninterrupted time with my daughter. Right. She's so cool. Like during the day. Yeah. You know, I get to pick her up and she's just so yummy when I pick her up and she just hugs me so tight and I get so excited. It's the coolest thing. Is they get my daughter. I mean, it's, it's surprising that we didn't really talk about family much on here. Yeah. But when my daughter sees me, like at, 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 at three o'clock when I pick her up, it's the most beautiful thing. It's one of the greatest feelings. Dude, it's three o'clock. I know. I'm that she's. A, she, I, they, they told me I could pick her up late, regardless. Oh, okay. In a couple minutes. It's not a big deal, but it's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. And it's so nice that I get to do this here. And then I spend about an hour. I go home and I go to spend an hour and I come back and I work with the guys. It's just amazing. I get to do that. Yeah. And and me as a boss. Take that very seriously. Yeah. yeah. I never got that because I've always got just keep putting in as much as you can and just keep being better. And I, even though, I mean, that's how it always is yeah. with, with my bosses. Maybe it was my perception, right. but to me, if I have a bunch of people who work for me and work in this community and they're filling themselves up with their people, um, they're going to work way better. Yeah. And they're going to give the love for real. And I'm not going to have burnout. And there's, you know, there's such an important piece. And I've learned a lot from it. And I'm glad that you're benefiting from it. Loving it. And loving working with you. Um, Okay. We're going to stop now. I had one more question. I had one more question. I I don't know. I I was curious. uh, It may be that to me, as I was thinking about the question, it sounded like uh, an arrogant type of question. Okay. But I guess I'll say it anyway, because now I am. I'm curious how it is to work for me. That was the question. That was supposed to come up in the beginning, wasn't it? Was it? I you mentioned something like okay. that. Okay. And I'll tell you. I yeah. Said, um, and you kind of answered a tiny bit, but. Yeah. There's a couple things, but. Yeah. Um, Rosh Hashanah, I got to spend the re- on uh, Rosh Hashanah with our guys on a retreat in Madrigos. Mm-hmm. And your brother Kivi was there. And he spoke, and he had a beautiful speech. But he spoke a little bit about growing up in your shadow, and what was that? Like, what that was, was like for him? Because everybody there knows Sonny, and he got to speak a little bit about that. And right. I went up to him afterwards, and I said, "By the way, I, I relate a lot to you, because right now I'm I'm living in Sonny's shadow." <laughs> <laughs> Is that when I tell people that, like people, like people will say that Shalom's a new Sonny, right? Because I took over a lot of your responsibilities here. Yeah. And then parents and every people are just like, that's very big shoes to fill. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And, and sometimes I'll find myself thinking like, what would Sonny do in this situation? Right. To try to do, to try to show up for the guys. I, I think that it's really cool. That is cool. You know, but it's not, it's, and it's and not that I uh, idolize you, but uh, there's two things. Like I'm working for you here. And you I better I've, not idolize I've you. also, I'm I've, going to let you down. I've, I, but I've also argued with you on what we should do and how. hundred percent. Right. And we come to, and, and, and you listen as well. You don't always just say my way or the highway. Right. You know, it could be there's differences and we discuss it and it's really nice. And I mean, I love working here. I, I tell my wife sees it. My wife sees it also. She's like, I mean, there are some days where I come home exhausted because I'm exhausted. Yeah. You know, there's a lot, a lot of work on, to do. A lot of work. But like she's, I've, I've worked in this field and I worked, uh, I used to work in an outpatient and I get home just exhausted and kind of miserable. She's like, you don't, you're not miserable. You're happy. Right. And she's been noticing that. And like, that's just from working here. I'm working for Sonny. Right. I get to be happy, you know, and like, no, I matter. You're making me feel work. very special. You should feel special, Sonny. <laughs> you should feel special. I'm glad. Yeah. And it's really, it's really, really like, I, I mentioned this a lot, but I love this job. Love that I get to work here. I love so much about it. Um, and it's, I love the guys. I love the work. I love, um, I love g- g- the new, like the new guys coming in when they're kind of, a, kind of a challenge to really for them to understand what we do and how we do. Right. And even for old guys, sometimes it gets hard where they want to beat themselves up. Right. They want us to beat them up too, you know? 
They do. It's just so beautiful to just like, you know, I just, that whole journey is so nice. It's so, it, it's amazing. And like, and like, I get to, you know, learn because I want to learn and not because I have to. And like, I get to know that there's so many ways of helping people just by being yourself genuinely and showing up for others. And, you know, it's just, it's just so beautiful. And I love it. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay, this is awesome. Okay, yeah. we really went over, Amazing. and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. It's me too. Thank um, you so I much. think this is the longest podcast, but uh, thanks for coming, man. Yeah, thanks for having thanks for me. for being here. Thank you for this day that I've been given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this chance. Thank you for this chance to live anew